Okay, well, welcome everyone to our self-care through food, preventing nutritional deficiencies uh, on specifically talking on magnesium today. I'm Michelle McDonald Wurstuck. I'm one of the dietitians with the Hamilton Family Health Team, and I'm here with my colleague Hillary. Hi, I'm Hillary Millard. I'm also one of the dietitians with the Family Health Team. I'm happy to be here today. Great, here we go. So today we're going to talk about a few topics, um, talking about how what we eat is very important for nourishing our body and our brain. We're going to start to jump into the area of nutritional deficiencies and some of the common deficiencies that we might be seeing um, in family practice. And specifically today, we're going to focus on magnesium. And magnesium is a very important mineral. We're going to talk about why, and then we're going to go through how much we need on a daily basis some of the myths and truths we might have heard about magnesium, find out if you're eating enough magnesium, and then if people do have a deficiency, we're going to highlight some of the strategies we use to correct that. Um, and so this is just the first of several webinars we're going to be having on nutritional deficiencies. Our next one will be focusing on deficiencies like iron and B12. So we hope you can join us for that as well. We're going to have questions at the end, um, but feel free in the chat box if you do have questions as we're talking to just type them in and we will have time to uh, address them at the end of the session. So nourishing your body and your brain. So we know that what you eat can make such a difference to not just your physical, but also your mental health too. It gives you energy, you feel better, it can stabilize mood. Um, and in addition, we know there's many strategies we can use to help improve things like your blood sugar, your cholesterol, and your blood pressure. As well, we, we're getting into some great research these days showing that what you eat um, and the foods you choose can actually help reduce the risk of some of the mental health conditions that we are seeing, such as depression and anxiety, as well as manage them. So the key nutrients for optimal physical and mental health are listed here. Protein, carbohydrates, and fats are all macronutrients that supply us with calories and energy. And we've highlighted some of the key ones there. Also vitamins and minerals. These are called micronutrients. And these are also very important for how we use fuel in the body. And today specifically, we're going to focus on one of those minerals, and that's magnesium. So magnesium is a mineral that is very important in so many different functions in the body. It's involved in over 300 enzymatic uh, reactions and is involved in multiple systems, our circulation system, respiration, our skeletal and muscle cell system, metabolic system, central nervous system, as well as with immune function and inflammation. And low magnesium has been linked with many conditions that we see in family practice, including things like heart disease and hypertension, stroke, dyslipidemia or high cholesterol, as well as atrial fibrillation. In terms of respiration, low magnesium levels have been associated with asthma and COPD. And in terms of the skeletal system, osteoporosis, as well as osteoarthritis have both been linked um, or associated with low magnesium levels. Metabolically, diabetes and metabolic syndrome. In terms of our central nervous system, depression, anxiety, migraine and addiction, as well as inflammation. So you can see quite a few systems are influenced by the magnesium status in the body. So Hillary, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, so we have a question here. True or false, is magnesium an important mineral for sleep and sleep of brain neurotransmitters? So it wasn't on our list before, um, but certainly we know that to be true. So um, if you move ahead there, Michelle, we'll go to the next slide. So yes, we do know that um, nearly 50% of over, older adults do have insomnia or some sort of sleep disruption. Um, you know, oftentimes when we're talking to patients, a lot of people, you know, over the age of 65 are, are getting up frequently through the night, are not having good sleep quality. And what we do know is that magnesium has a, a pretty significant impact on two brain chemicals that are known to have an impact on the quality of our sleep. These chemicals are called GABA and NMDA, which have been well studied in terms of their association with sleep quality. Um, so magnesium supplements have been shown to improve sleep time, efficiency, and our serum cortisol levels, which again, 
cortisol is kind of like that stress hormone and is often related to our sleep as well. So we do know that if you're choosing to supplement, um, which we're going to talk a lot about the supplementation and things like that um, early later on in this in this program, um, but we do recommend you taking it at night. So that way you're helping your body to calm down, relax, and, and prepare for a nice, good quality sleep. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit uh, um, more about supplementing and, and how you should go about doing that um, later on. So we also know that magnesium and migraines have some association. So migraines, and there's actually some, um, uh, some evidence towards cluster headaches as well. Um, and so we do know that this may reduce frequency, duration, and intensity of migraines by about 41% compared to placebo, which means that those who took magnesium saw improvement compared to those who didn't. Um, and so the dose that we have here is actually quite a high dose. And we're, again, we're going to talk about this um, in a bit. But this is um, what they've been showing in the studies, which is 600 milligrams of magnesium citrate um, for three months and showed improvements in um, frequency and severity in some participants. Um, so, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about supplementing and dosing, but, um, you know, so this is not necessarily the case for all, um, all conditions. So we're going to talk a little bit about that um, in a few slides. Um, but it is important to know that if you are supplementing, to talk to your dietitian, um, and we can definitely help you out with that and make sure that it's specific to you. So true or false, make, taking magnesium supplements can help to improve muscle cramps. So you may have heard this from your dietitian, your doctor, um, if you get those kind of muscle cramps in the legs. And so we know this um, to be sort of true. <laughs> there are some conflicting results when you look at the studies. We do know, however, that magnesium is really important for muscle contraction. So, um, you know, certain electrolytes in the body are actually going to contract the muscle and magnesium is what helps to let that um, contraction go and relax the muscle. So we know that muscle cramps um, can be related to magnesium deficiency, but whether supplementing with magnesium or not helps is kind of unclear in the research. But the way I see it is that magnesium is helpful for so many other things that if you are suffering from muscle cramps, um, certainly trying magnesium is, is worth a shot. But it could also be related to other things. So you might see other nutrient deficiencies. Potassium is a common one, but it could also be calcium or sodium. Um, although sodium deficiency is not one that we see too often these days. Um, and it could also be related to dehydration. This is really important when we're in these hot days in the middle of summer. Dehydration can be a big factor when it comes to your muscle function and, and um, you know, cramping. Um, it could also be sitting for too long. This is something that we often struggle with, especially um, you know, our senior population, um, and we're all kind of stuck inside right now. So we may be doing a little bit too much sitting. Um, tense or stiff muscles. So doing some stretching and poor blood circulation as well. And as Michelle had mentioned a, a few slides ago, that magnesium is really important for blood circulation. So, you know, to summarize, I would say, you know, it's worth looking at magnesium in terms of helping with muscle cramping if this is something that you suffer from. Um, but there can be other relations as well. So it's, again, helpful to talk to your dietitian or your doctor, and we can really kind of uh, sort through some of this and, and get to the root cause. So one of the other wonderful things about magnesium is its impact on your heart. So lower magnesium intakes have actually been associated with higher rates of heart disease. So we know that we can start to see some more concerning issues in the heart, especially in relation to um, blood pressure. Um, and this is because um, when you think about salt, what salt does is it brings um, water into the bloodstream. And like a garden hose, if there's more water, there's more pressure. And what magnesium helps to do is it helps to push that water back out. It helps to counteract the effects of sodium in our diet. So having low levels of magnesium can often also be associated with high blood pressure. Um, so especially blood pressure pills and diuretics, these things can often deplete our body of magnesium. Um, and so helping out our, our, our blood pressure pills and helping out our, the rest of our system by taking a little extra magnesium, whether it's through our diet or with supplementation, um, can actually help to lower your blood pressure. Um, so that's a very interesting. And I think it's um, 
if you have any heart conditions, um, it is important to make sure that you're, you know, talking with a pharmacist potentially, um, or your, your dietitian or your doctor, because especially if you're on a, a mitt full of medications, it can get a little bit complicated. But certainly when it comes to magnesium and your heart health, we know that there is a positive association. So magnesium is wonderful for the heart. Um, yes. So magnesium and diabetes. This is one that I'm really um, particularly interested in. Um, and low magnesium and magnesium deficiency can occur in a good chunk of um, the population of people with diabetes, about 25 to 38 percent, which is a pretty high amount. Um, low magnesium has been linked with a decline in kidney function. And this is something, you know, when you have diabetes or, um, you know, you're, you're in that realm, it, we really have to be very very protective of our kidneys because diabetes itself can have a negative impact on the kidneys themselves. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep our kidneys healthy. So we don't want that low magnesium causing any more problems. Um, we've also seen that specifically with diabetes prevention, um, that magnesium can be, um, you know, associated with um, developing, or low magnesium can be associated with developing diabetes. So we wanna make sure that we are um, keeping our magnesium intakes up, and this can be really helpful for a couple of different reasons. And probably one of the biggest reasons why magnesium is so integral when it comes to diabetes is because one of the big tasks that magnesium has in our body, so Michelle was mentioning that it's over 300 different reactions in the body that magnesium is actually uh, involved in. And one of the major tasks that magnesium has is actually in our carbohydrate metabolism. So breaking down those sugars sugars and turning that sugar into energy, right? Because that doesn't happen magically. It happens com with complex chemical reactions and magnesium is um, integral in that, in that um, happening. So we want to make sure we're helping our body convert that sugar into energy and not just hanging around and causing trouble. Um, so, it, oh, I, sorry, I just missed a, a point there, Michelle. Um, so if you have diabetes, should you be taking a supplement? So again, this is kind of conflicting, but certainly whether you supplement or not, we're gonna talk about food sources and every single person who's watching this, who you know, everybody can stand to eat more magnesium rich foods and we're going to tell you which foods are, are rich in magnesium and whether or not to supplement is a really good conversation to have with your dietitian. Sorry, you can go ahead, thanks. Um, another one of the cool things that um, magnesium has been associated with um, is in women's health and specifically um, magnesium and PMS symptoms. And so, you know, this can actually improve symptoms including mood changes, fluid retention, and um, these types of things. So it can also uh, help if you tend to get really intense headaches with uh, premenstrual migraines and things like that. Um, it also seems to reduce um, anxiety-related premenstrual symptoms, including nervous tension, mood swings, irritability. Um, so we, you know, that could be very helpful for anybody who's suffering with, you know, really intense PMS symptoms. And it just goes to show you the wide range of um, impacts that low magnesium can have on our body and it can show up in weird and different ways. So this is just another one of those cool things. So anxiety. So, I'll, so Hillary, thanks for that intro to the anxiety piece because there actually is a significant role of magnesium in many neurological disorders and we've highlighted two of them here, anxiety and depression and particularly for those people who suffer from depression, Magnesium seems to be a key thing to be assessing whether or not your level is appropriate or if you need to benefit from um, taking additional magnesium supplementation in addition to a diet that's rich in magnesium because they do find that low magnesium levels do are, tend to be associated with depression and that supplementation, particularly combined with some of the medications that are used for depression, seems to offer some relief. So it actually seems to be a treatment protocol that has some pretty strong evidence. And we put a few studies here. There's quite a few out there. And the reason they think magnesium is so important is in addition to all of those other um, enzymatic reactions we talked about, 
this seems to be a key nutrient for keeping the neurons healthy. So really helping with that myelination, with the nerve conduction and transmission, and how the nerves communicate um, is really, really important. And magnesium, again, like we already mentioned, is involved in so many systems in the body. It's also a very key uh, nutrient for our, our neurological system. So for those of you suffering from depression or anxiety, that's another good question to talk with your family doctor about or the dietitian or the pharmacist to see, you know, what is your current intake of magnesium? How can we help you have more? And is supplementation required? So this was something I wanted to share with you, uh, this idea of nutritional psychiatry. So I don't know if people have heard of this term, but there's such a large growing body of literature out there showing that what we eat is so important for our mental health and just as important um, as it is for our physical health. And that a healthy style of eating seems to be very protective of not just our physical health, but our mental health. And this whole idea of looking at certain um, nutrients and ways of eating, eating patterns, and, and see if they have benefit on mental health is actually having quite a bit of literature. So that's quite exciting to see, because so many Canadians do suffer from mental health conditions. And at current stats is one in five Canadians. And the cost is quite high to the person who's suffering from a mental health condition, both personally uh, as they affect on your quality of life, on your social interactions, on work, for example, but also in terms of health care and some of the current treatments we have for some of these conditions are really only partial management. And so it's exciting to see that the area of nutrition may be something that offers some symptom relief for many patients. So who should we be thinking about that could possibly be at risk of low magnesium? And Hillary's mentioned a few um, during this, the, the PMS and diabetes, for example. Um, particularly, we find that um, GI conditions where there may be malabsorption of magnesium, so people suffering from heartburn, some things like celiac disease and Crohn's, diabetes we've already mentioned, so metabolic issues, hypertension. Again, Hillary already mentioned some of the literature showing benefit of supplementing with magnesium there, but also other people who may be, um, for example, having malabsorption from bariatric surgery, people who might be cutting back on certain foods. So as dietitians, sometimes people come to us where they're worried about eating certain foods and they're restricting certain food groups. And that's one of the things we start to worry about is the magnesium intake because magnesium is sprinkled across multiple food groups. And when people start to limit certain categories, we start to worry about what are those nutrients that could possibly be missing, and magnesium is definitely one of them. And another interesting group of people who might want to consider their magnesium levels is those people taking calcium supplements. So calcium and magnesium work in a balance together. And when there's too little magnesium and too much calcium, so if, for example, we're taking supplements and eating a diet that's already rich in calcium, we may end up with too much calcium. And that can actually affect how cells work and the movement um, and electro sort of conductivity in between the cells. And it can actually worsen things like insulin resistance, blood sugar, blood pressure, et cetera. So that is something that I think that many people may not know about. Um, and again, another reason to connect with your dietitian to have that discussion about does this apply to me? And this is what I was just discussing, that the too much calcium from food or supplementation can start to affect how cells react. And they, that it actually enhances the excitability, and it can lead to things like high blood pressure, high blood glucose, as well as an overproduction of cholesterol. So how much magnesium do we need? So when we look at the literature in terms of recommended dietary allowance, this was generated years and years ago. Um, and so there has been a question of, are these amounts even adequate for today's population? So just looking at these amounts, data in the literature have a large range anywhere between 42 to 75% of Americans, as well as Canadians, are probably not getting enough magnesium. And if, in fact, these doses were created years ago where they have underestimated how much we truly need, we may, in fact, need more than this amount. Um, and, in fact, some of the newer research is looking at um, uh, algorithms that predict how much we need based on our body weight in pounds. Um, and for most adults, it's actually three times their body weight in pounds, which is usually much lower than these levels. But a Currently, this is what we have, these levels, and so these are the levels we are using, um, but we have to keep that in the back of our mind that they may, in fact, not be adequate for everyone. 
So why are we not getting enough magnesium in our foods? Well, there's several reasons. One is the reason of low intake. So sometimes people are eating foods that may not have a lot of magnesium in them. Um, we may see a difference because of the soil quality, uh, where the, the foods are actually grown, and the issue of processing. So we know processed foods, we lose a lot of nutrients in processing, and that includes magnesium. So if our diets are very heavy in processed foods and less of what we call whole foods, we can start to see a low magnesium intake. There's also the issue of absorption. So we've talked about um, some of the GI conditions where people are perhaps absorbing less of the nutrients they're taking in, such as post-bariatric surgery, for example, some of the inflammatory bowel conditions like Crohn's, for example, but also with aging. So as we age, we start to see changes in the nutrients and certain nutrients we require higher amounts of with aging. And magnesium is actually one of those minerals that we need to keep an eye on because our needs may actually increase. And particularly if it's related to medication usage. So there's many medications, and I'll go through that in a minute, many medications that impair the absorption of magnesium. And as Hillary's mentioned, magnesium is involved in so many systems in the body that if we start to see impaired absorption, you can start to see effects of those, those different systems. And then there's the issue of loss. So perhaps someone's eating enough magnesium, but they're losing it somehow. So in the GI tract, it might be through diarrhea. So if people are using a lot of laxatives or they're experiencing a lot of diarrhea, sometimes medications can cause those effects. So again, another reason to speak to your dietitian because we have a, a, a quite a big book of side effects from medications and some of the nutrient interactions with medications that we're very happy to to look through with you and find out what will work best for you to minimize any of these symptoms you might be having. And again, when it comes to kidneys, we can lose magnesium um, uh, with diabetes as well, with changes in kidneys functioning, as well as with alcohol intake. So that's another big one. Alcohol dramatically affects magnesium absorption. And so that's something else to consider uh, in your question if you're getting enough. So let's talk about magnesium and compare foods a little bit. So here we have two breakfasts for you. We thought we'd compare an egg and sausage and toast breakfast with an oatmeal with milk, almonds, and blueberries. And you can see foods that are richer in magnesium. Some of the seeds and nuts, for example, are quite rich in magnesium. So this oatmeal breakfast is giving you 151 milligrams of magnesium versus the egg and toast is only giving you 28 milligrams of magnesium. So again, keeping in mind your daily intake, we need you somewhere between 320 and 420 milligrams, 420 milligrams of magnesium a day, only having 28 at breakfast and you eat three meals a day, that may not get you up to that 320 to 420 milligrams a day that we know we all need. And in fact, we might need more. So medications, I wanted to just give you a list, and this is a short list. There's actually many more that could be on this list, but these are some of the more common medications that do impact on your magnesium level. So for anybody who suffers from heartburn and may be on medications called PPIs or proton pump inhibitors, which is quite a large number of folks in our populations, that can affect your magnesium level. If you're on water pills like a, a hydrochlor hydrochlorothiazide, what we call a thiazide diuretic, that can make you lose not only potassium, but magnesium as well. Antacids as well, antihistamines, corticosteroids, and again, I already mentioned, calcium supplements we do not recommend anymore. We really do want to encourage you to get your calcium from food sources if possible. And again, that's for those dietitians. We're happy to work with you to help you figure that out. So we do want to try to avoid having to use calcium supplementation. We want to rely on the diet for calcium um, because we do know too much calcium can also be another negative effect on magnesium. Hilary, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. So if we look at the magnesium level in the water, um, there is a certain level that we'd be looking at. Now, you, don't you might not necessarily see your blood work, although there's so much um, technology now that we can see our blood work when it comes in. So this is the, the optimal level that we'd be looking for, 0.85 to 0.95. Now, this anything under 
five might not necessarily flag as abnormal in, in, your, in your blood work. Um, so between 0.85 and 0.75, we know is like kind of insufficient. Um, in, it might be kind of what we call chronic and latent, which means it's kind of long term um, and it's kind of in the background. It might not show up as any specific symptoms. But if your level is less than 0.75, we really would encourage you to treat this. And so treatment would include a magnesium rich diet. And we would encourage all people to have a magnesium rich diet, which is part of the reason why we felt it was so um, important to do a webinar specifically just on magnesium, because it's kind of this like background nutrient that not a lot of people think about. Um, so certainly a magnesium rich diet is really important. I would encourage everybody to put some focus to that. And we'll let you know which foods are, are rich sources of magnesium. But also, um, if your level is less than 0.75, magnesium supplementation for three months and then rechecking to make sure that it's boosted back up is a really good idea. So again, that might not be something that you do on your own. It would be in conjunction with your healthcare team, but it is a good idea to make sure that we're treating that deficiency because magnesium is an electrolyte. This means that the blood levels don't always reflect what's actually going on in the body. So sometimes there is even cases where you might show up as normal, but your cells are still a little bit deficient. Um, so it is important to not only rely on the blood levels because it's always kind of this like, um, you know, special balance. And we're just trying to do our best we can with science to figure out what's optimal for you. But um, my guess is, is that if you have any of the conditions or you're on some of the medications that we talked about, you might not even really need to check your serum levels and really just focus in on that rich diet um, and, you know, potentially even supplements. There's, um, we will, we'll talk a little bit, but there's not a lot of harm that can happen with too much magnesium, but we will talk about that. Um, so symptoms of deficiency can affect the whole body and they can be kind of insidious where they creep up on you and it's kind of unclear what's going on. And I think, you know, one of the ones that I often talk about and we haven't really touched on too much is fatigue and energy levels. A lot of people that I talk to, um, really feel sluggish, they feel their, their, their you know, energy is low. Um, and I often find that with fatigue, um, there can definitely be some magnesium deficiency going on. So it does depend on your serum level. And it is, you know, if you have the ability to get it checked and look into those numbers, it's a good idea, but it's not absolutely required. Um, and you can be asymptomatic or you might have mild symptoms or it might be some of these other kind of bigger issue things that might not be like a direct correlation to magnesium deficiency. Because, you know, like we said, magnesium is helpful in so many different areas of the body. We're so depleted of it naturally in our, in our current environment. So it's it's very likely that much of the population could stand to use a little bit more. Um, and, you know, of course, cardiovascular disease, you might see your blood pressure increasing, your higher cholesterol, your, your, your sugars um, getting affected. So um, there's so many different things that can show up as deficiency. So um, if anybody wants to take a little screenshot of this or take a picture with their phone, it would be a great idea to do that. We'll hang out here for a, a couple minutes. Um, so having those magnesium rich foods every day is really, really important. And you can see based on this list, you're probably looking at it going, yeah, I don't eat a lot of these things, right? So um, working on getting more of this is super, super helpful. Um, and, you know, there can be some easy ways to just, you know, maybe you're throwing some pumpkin seeds into your salad or onto your oatmeal or into your cereal. Um, I actually love pumpkin seeds roasted and I just eat them plain as a snack with a piece of fruit. Um, is one of my favorites. Um, hemp seeds, if anybody's not tried hemp seeds before, there's wonderfully rich source of magnesium. And I find that um, they're not, uh, like they're very like, they hang out in the background. They don't have a ton of flavor. They don't really have like a ton of crunch or texture. They're just kind of there and they're really easy to throw. I often even will put it on some like peanut butter toast. Um, it's really easy to throw into smoothies. Um, they can be a little bit pricey, but you can try it. If you've never tried them before, I would encourage you to go to a bulk store and just buy a little bit and just, you know, sprinkle it on some stuff and see how you like it. But they're very neutral. They, they're not gonna offend anybody. 
um, beans, uh, black beans and, and these types of things are a wonderful source. So black beans are the most rich uh, source of, of magnesium and iron actually in terms of the legumes, but certainly all of your beans and legumes will give you some magnesium. Same with spinach, um, it's definitely the most rich source of, of magnesium, but all of your other leafy greens like Swiss chard and beet greens and kale, um, even a little bit of in romaine, there is going to be some magnesium there as well because um, magnesium is actually in the center of the chlorophyll molecule so you will anything that's green um, will give you a little bit. Um, sunflower seeds and actually sesame seeds as well is not on this list but your seeds as well as your nuts are a wonderful source of magnesium so um, and whether it's pumpkin seeds, hemp seeds, sunflower seeds, a great thing to get in daily. Um, quinoa is another one because it's actually technically a seed. It's a lot of the time we think of it as a grain, but it is technically a seed. And of course, cashews and avocado is another good one as well. So if you don't have to like memorize all these foods, but what you can think about is a lot of those plant rich foods, like my nuts, my seeds, my legumes, our leafy greens, our whole grains, and I threw in there dark chocolate. It's actually can be a wonderful rich source of magnesium and uh, an enjoyable way to get it in. Um, I would encourage you to get quality ones, but like a, you know, a Kit Kat bar, unfortunately, is not going to do it. <laughs> Darn. Um, but certainly like a nice, good quality dark chocolate, like maybe 70% or more, can certainly give you a nice, rich source of magnesium. Um, so yes, we do want to also make sure that we're kind of limiting some of those foods that can deplete our magnesium sources. So this is going to be foods that might be higher in sugar, higher in salt, and again, you can think about, you know, a lot of these processed foods are, are going to naturally be higher in those things and also naturally lower in magnesium. So kind of easing up on those things. You know, there's always room for everything in the diet, but it's just how frequently are you having these things and, and how much at one sitting. Um, but also, you know, some of our beverages like coffee and soda and pop, even diet pop um, and alcohol can also have an impact on your magnesium rich foods. And the wonderful thing about, you know, focusing on the diet when we're thinking about our magnesium rich sources is that with that list that we were just reviewing that is a rich source of magnesium, the bonus is that it's also a rich source of many other wonderful nutrients. So if you're just focusing and saying like, you know, I don't like any of these foods, I'm just gonna supplement, you're also missing out from all of the other wonderful heart healthy benefits. And um, these things have been known to be helpful for a wide variety of, of um, diseases and disorders and things like that. So they're also gonna help you in other ways too. So it's not just magnesium that you're getting from these foods, it's also iron and fiber and protein and healthy fats and a lot of wonderful things. So we really encourage those food sources first and foremost. Okay. So how much might you need to correct a magnesium deficiency? So if you're truly deficient, or if you feel like you have a lot of these other conditions and you're not super keen on some of those food sources and, and you do feel um, like you need a magnesium supplement, again, we don't, you know, don't want to sound like a broken record, but come to us. That's what we're here for. Um, but certainly there's so many different magnesium supplements on the market. There's about eight or nine different kinds and they are different. They are very different in terms of how the, well they're absorbed as well as how well they're tolerated. Okay, so um, probably the one that I recommend the most um, is the first one, the magnesium glycinate or bisglycinate. And this is best for treating deficiency. It's also really well absorbed and has very little side effects. Um, and the main side effect of high, you know, too much magnesium is going to be diarrhea. Um, so the next one would probably be magnesium citrate. Now this one can loosen the bowels a little bit. It is, uh, you know, rather gentle, but it can loosen the bowels a little bit. So if you tend towards constipation, maybe you want to try out the magnesium citrate, but we do recommend splitting the dose on the citrate form. So, um, you know, taking it in, in two smaller amounts, and that might be okay if you're already taking other pills at those times. Um, but it is always a good idea to just do a quick review with your pharmacist if you are on a, you know, like a mitt full of, of pills to just connect with them and see when the best place and time is to take your magnesium. Um, and then you might also see something like magnesium chloride, which is often called slow mag. And you can see you actually need a much higher dose of this one because it's not as well absorbed. Um, so it, it is one that, you know, you might just need more to get the same impact. And we do recommend that you avoid the oxide form. And um, 
definitely high doses of this can cause diarrhea, even sometimes low doses. And one other thing that I'll say is that oftentimes if you go and you look at a supplement, it might just say magnesium on the front. Get out your you know, glasses and look at that tiny little writing that's on the side. They make it so small. But um, you know, it is a good idea to see what forms are in there. Um, and I usually just go right for the glycinate or bisglycinate and definitely avoid the oxide. And the other two are, are options as well, depending on what's going on. But you, you don't have to make this decision alone. Um, Epsom salts are something that I also love to talk about with magnesium because Epsom salts are actually a magnesium based salt that you can add to your bath water and treatment with Epsom salts can actually reverse symptoms of deficiency, sometimes even more efficiently than oral supplements because you don't have to worry as much about absorption, especially if you do have some of those other conditions that affect your, your absorption. Um, so we would recommend if you are going to go this way that A, you're thinking safety first. So can you get in and out of the tub safely? Um, and that's a, a big one for sure. And some people just don't like the idea of having a bath. So, you know, it's, it's really, you know, a personal decision, but you can get really lovely absorption through the skin. Um, and you get this kind of added benefit of relaxation and helping with muscle pain and things like that. So personally, I find the idea of taking a bath and Epsom salts and having a piece of dark chocolate is much better than taking some pills. But, you know, it's whatever feels right for you. So it is a, an option. Um, but you can see if you're trying to treat deficiency, right, you don't want to take the pills and you're trying to treat deficiency, you do have to do it quite often. And in the heat of summer, it might not be, you know, as much of a, a good option for you, but it's there as an option. So as I mentioned, one of the biggest signs of having too much magnesium is diarrhea. Um, you can get, um, if you're like really getting super high levels of magnesium, um, there can be other issues like, you know, affecting the heart and these types of things because it's an electrolyte, because it's um, dealing with muscle function, there can be other concerns, but the first sign you're going to see is diarrhea. So um, certainly we want to just, you know, be cautious of that. But otherwise, uh, you know, it's pretty fairly safe, I would say. So what we know is magnesium is more common than we think, right? We would really encourage every single person in Canada, in Hamilton, everywhere to really start thinking about choosing magnesium rich foods every day and at every meal. So again, seeds and nuts, whole grains, legumes, so that's your beans, lentils, chickpeas, peas, and your leafy greens. We really wanna start getting some more of these foods and um, you know, supplementing when necessary. Okay. Great. Thanks, Hillary. That was a great recap. So bottom line is, uh, this was a nice summary of some of the literature showing which conditions would benefit from supplementation. And as you mentioned, many, many conditions that we see in family practice may actually benefit from a magnesium-rich diet and some magnesium supplementation. So that ranges from prenatal pregnancy conditions, which we didn't talk about today, but preeclampsia has quite a bit of literature. The heart conditions we did talk about today, hypertension and cardiac arrhythmia. If someone has diabetes or metabolic syndrome or pre-diabetes, as well as high cholesterol, we call hyperlipidemia, as well as some of the CNS or central nervous system um, type of conditions, migraine, asthma, or asthma is respiratory, depression, anxiety, as well as PMS and osteoporosis. So again, there's quite a bit of literature on this. And as you mentioned, very, very common for people to, to be deficient in magnesium. And we really want to encourage them to add those magnesium rich foods and then seek out additional help if they want to discuss this in more detail with their family doctor or dietitian. Vitamin D. Did you want to do this one? Yeah, sure. sure. Vitamin D is a really common deficiency in Canada, and the main reason for that is because uh, we just don't get enough sun up here, right? Um, so we're blessed right now to be getting, you know, a string of sunshine in these last few days, but this is not common for us, and many people might even avoid it outside because it's too hot for them. So we really want to make sure that if you're, you know, not getting some regular sun um, on the skin, that, um, you know, that vitamin D is, is critical. And what we, we've known for a long time that vitamin D3 helps our body to absorb calcium better. And just recently, we're, just, you know, found out that it also helps us to absorb our magnesium better. So if you're deficient, 
deficient in vitamin D, very likely you're deficient in calcium and magnesium as well. Um, and this, we know that um, we stopped even covering vitamin D tests. So you can get your serum levels of vitamin D checked, but for most people you have to pay about 30 or $35 because they assume most Canadians are gonna be deficient. So it is um, important for all of us to supplement with a thousand units of vitamin D3 if you're not getting some you know, safe sun um, exposure. So there is a limited amounts in our foods. You might get it from fish and fluid milk, but if you don't consume those things, likely you're getting no food sources. Um, and oftentimes we're worried about melanoma, so we might use sunscreen or cover our skin from the sun, which would actually block vitamin D production. So we do encourage uh, most Canadians, especially, especially, especially in the winter time, to supplement with vitamin D and to kind of assess in the summertime. But I often recommend everybody take at least a thousand every day and then in the winter time especially if you have some other conditions maybe bump it up to two thousand depending on, on what's going on with you yeah the doctors may recommend different levels too right depending on your health conditions but minimum is a thousand units a day for sure of vitamin d Okay, well, we get to wrap up a little bit now. So we hope everyone has enjoyed some of this information. I've really enjoyed being part of this webinar. I always learn something new from you, Hillary. It's great. So I hope you walked away today with understanding how magnesium is an important mineral for many functions in the body and how that medications, aging, intake, lots of things can affect and impact on our serum magnesium levels. And I hope you, that you've walked away with a couple foods that you think, hmm, I had no idea they had such high magnesium. I think I'm going to add those to my diet. And really knowing what to, to look for that could be signs of low magnesium and then reaching out to your healthcare team for further discussion if you think, hmm, I might be a little bit low in this, might need to uh, look at ways to measure this and maybe add more to my diet and possibly benefit from a supplement for a short term. But the, uh, the bottom line for this presentation, like all of our presentations, is really to get you thinking about what's one or two things that you can do this week that will actually make your diet richer in magnesium. So goal setting, when it comes to making changes, we know that setting small, realistic changes seem to be more successful in the long run. So if you're thinking about your week ahead, you know, what's one thing you could do this week that could improve the magnesium level in your diet? You know, you might add some hemp hearts onto your yogurt each day, or you might enjoy a small handful of nuts as a snack each day. Many, many different ideas. These are just a couple examples, but we encourage you to think about, you know, what could be a small thing I could add this week to increase the magnesium in my diet. And then if you want more help, as we mentioned, um, we want you to reach out to your family doctor's offices. Most of the doctor's offices, or many of the doctor's offices, about 165 in Hamilton, have dietitians in the office. So we are always happy to book a phone appointment with you, have a discussion, do a bit of an assessment to see where you're at in terms of your intake, and to give you ideas of, of improving that magnesium level. Or you could email us at the Hamilton Family Health Team, and the email is provided there on the screen. Or you can also go to some great websites. So for example, Dietitians of Canada has a wonderful website called Unlock Food, um, Unlock the Potential of Food is what it implies, as well as a fabulous app on recipes. So if you're looking for recipes that have some wonderful foods included with the nutrition information also posted for you, I encourage you to, to access this Cookspiration app that's free and people are really enjoying it. We're getting lots of positive feedback on this app. As well, I would like to make sure that you know we have other groups online. So we're doing a series of webinars. During COVID, we wanna make sure we can get information to you because we know it's a little bit trickier getting information um, and accessing your healthcare team. So we offer a series of different webinars um, and you can always go to our events calendar there listed and it will post not only the groups we offer as well as the webinars we offer every month. So we have a lifestyle group that's six week um, course called Healthy You Lifestyle Group and it's online. We also have a two-week diabetes group for those people wanting to learn more about diabetes uh, strategies to manage your diabetes as well as cooking demonstrations. So if you're into cooking we have several of our dietitians demonstrate how to prepare healthy meals quick and easily and again that's all via uh, Zoom um, zoom invites so if you're interested please go to our website click on the session you're interested in and we'll be happy to send you the zoom invite as well as the participant resources to join that group 
and some of the webinars coming up. We have webinars every month on heart health, diabetes, food and mood, and self-care through food with slightly different themes every month. Next month, we're going to expand on the self-care through food, and we're going to start to look at other deficiencies we commonly see in family practice. And those will specific, I can't even say that. That's a hard word. <laughs> we'll be focusing on iron and B12, um, which is, again, very, very common. And that may be something you might be interested in. So we encourage you to join us for that as well. And then we want to take a minute to ask for some feedback from you. These are our polling questions. And I, we're going to launch them and give you a few minutes to um, answer them. And then hopefully have time for questions. Um, at the end if you have any questions about our webinar today. So take a minute to um, answer some of the polling questions. We've tried to make them very straightforward with yes or no replies, so it saves you a little bit of time when you're filling them out. So we'll give people a few seconds. I see people replying already. Okay, then. So do we want to move on to any questions that we have? Do we have any questions in the chat box, Hillary? Uh, no, none yet. If anybody has any, we'd be happy to answer. They're probably trying to still finish the poll as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So one of my questions I have for you is on magnesium supplements and the cost. So which ones do you recommend in terms of um, cost effective? That's a great question. So um, I would say certainly the the one that I had recommended, the bisglycinate form, is probably going to be one of the more expensive ones. I've also seen the citrate one can be a little bit pricey depending on the way you buy it. You can get that like natural calm powder that comes as a, a powder and that one can be quite expensive. Um, so my guess is that um, probably some of the ones that like the the worse they are in terms of absorption, the, the cheaper they tend to be. So um, it's one of those things. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go and get the most expensive supplement, um, but I, my guess would be the slow mag. Have you seen that in the stores as well as being? I, I have, yeah. I've noticed the price of the magnesium citrate is not that bad because I was checking out some of the prices at stores like Shoppers and Walmart and Costco, and the pricing is, is pretty reasonable, um, particularly at places like Costco where you can get larger amounts for a good deal. Um, and yeah, I do caution people against the watching out for, especially the calcium magnesium combos, because that's often an oxide when we know the oxide is quite hard on the, the GI tract in terms of diarrhea. Plus, again, we don't really want people supplementing with calcium if the diet's already rich in calcium, right? So that's a really important piece, I think. I hope people can connect with their dietitian because, you know, years ago, people will put on calcium supplements all the time. And some of the people I meet are still on the same supplements they were told to take, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So I think it's, it's a good idea to connect with the dietitian to review to see, do you actually need that calcium supplement? And could you get it through food? And as well as now that we learn so much of how the calcium balances with the magnesium, I think it's really important people have that discussion with their, with their family doctor or particularly their dietitian as we're, you know, bringing, raising that awareness of our whole team. So many of our team members weren't aware of how magnesium is so effective, affected by so many medications and conditions. So it's, it's been a learning curve for everyone, which is great. Absolutely. And I think too, like you were mentioning, even if we can focus on um, increasing our vitamin D, right? So if we can <laughs> vitamin D instead of calcium and maybe even magnesium and just work on those food sources, then it's like we're trusting our body to, to absorb what it can when it can, right? So it, I think, you know, even getting, making sure you're getting your vitamin D status up and then letting that balance yeah. come into play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I sometimes get comments from patients saying, oh, as a dietitian, I never thought you'd recommend a supplement. I thought you could get everything from food. And, and um, that's always a great question because we ideally try to get everything from food, but we know vitamin D is the exception now that we have to supplement. We just can't meet those targets through food because the food sources are so few. And then with people with so many conditions and other medications, sometimes we do need to supplement with other, other um, vitamins and minerals to meet those increased needs that they have. And for example, the sake of 
magnesium. So if someone's on a water pill, for example, you know, Coversal Plus or anything that has a plus is a water pill, that would be someone that would want to consider like, do I, am I getting enough magnesium? Do I need to look closer at my, my magnesium intake? So would you recommend all magnesium supplements be taken at night? Or do you think there's a best No. Difference? No, I think, I mean, at night we use that one for sleep. So when people are, are trying to get a better quality uh, sleep, we recommend it in the evening. Um, it really can be taken any time of day, especially the low dose. If someone's using 150 milligrams of magnesium citrate, it's really up to them when they want to take it. Um, so that's a personal choice, but whatever is easier for them. Yeah. So is everyone going to go out and buy hemp hearts? Yeah. <laughs> hemp hearts is a great source of magnesium. And again, those are at Costco too. Like you get a big bag of them and they do taste so good. And so many things you can sprinkle them on anything and you get more protein as well. So and they're, make it like, cookies. they're just wonderful. I love yeah. Them. They're a great food choice, which some people are not even aware of. Right. So that's the one of the reasons probably why you and I love being in the area of dietetics. We love all these new foods that, we get to learn about and share with our patients. Exactly. And I honestly, I recommend pumpkin seeds like so often just because they're also one of the highest food sources of iron, yeah. which we're going to be talking about next month. So um, I, I'm always a big fan of pumpkin seeds and I would say I, I eat them almost every day. I'm obsessed with them. I was just talking to a lady just this morning who was worried about taking pumpkin seeds because she has diverticulosis and she'd been taught years ago she couldn't have nuts or seeds. But then I was giving her the good news is that if she chews really, really, really well, she'll be fine. And so she was quite happy to hear that she could, you know, start with pumpkin seeds. She actually had a question because she was buying all of those broccoli coleslaws that have pumpkin seeds in them. So she was quite worried about it. Um, and so quite happy to find out it has lots of magnesium. And if she chews well, she should be fine. So anyway, any other questions? Are we ready? I think we're good. That's it. Well, thank you, everyone. We'd like to just thank you for spending time with us today. And we encourage you to, to join us again. And we encourage you to go to our events calendar at www.hamiltonfht.ca because all of our sessions are posted there, as well as our colleagues. We have mental health colleagues who are having um, sessions on anxiety and managing stress during COVID. We also have our physiotherapists doing sessions on getting active. So there's great content there. And we encourage you to Join us and share with your friends and um, hopefully um, get the information that you need to stay healthy, right? Okay, so have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.